ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره all praises due to Allah we praise him we seek his assistance and we ask his forgiveness ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا and we seek refuge with Allah from our evil souls and our bad deeds ما يهده الله فلا مضل له Whosoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. وَمَا يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ And whosoever he allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا And I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of our worship except Allah, alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. May Allah exalt his mention, grant him peace, his companions and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. As to what follows, brothers and sisters in Islam, answering Bart Ehrman, why we suffer. Probably the title is somewhat ambiguous and confusing to some extent. But inshallah ta'ala by the time we're done, all that will be clarified. We will see why we chose this individual, the nature of his problem, the need for the answer, and how this is relevant to me and you and every human being upon earth. This particular subject that we'll be discussing tonight, insha'Allah, is relevant to every human being who is sane and will be held accountable in the sight of God on the Day of Judgment. And so we're reaching out to the whole world tonight, insha'Allah. So misconceptions will be removed and mysteries will be clarified and answered. Who is Bart Ehrman? He's the author of more than 20 books, including two New York Times bestsellers. The first is called Misquoting Jesus. It's an overview of the mistakes and changes that the ancient scribes made to the New Testament and the great impact this had upon the Bible being used today. And actually this is the point of connection between us Muslims and Professor Bart Ehrman. This is what we both agree about. This is what we've been trying, we've been trying to say for a long time to the Christians in particular. That they must understand that the book which they have is not preserved by God. And whenever it comes from the Muslims, there always seems to be a rejection. Whenever we say it, they say, well, you're Muslims. Actually, people will not accept the opinion of other religions. In the case of uh, Professor Bart Ehrman, he's from them. And he made this particular conclusion. And you will see some more details, inshallah. The second book is called God's Problem. And we will deal with that title and our reaction concerning that. How the Bible fails to answer our most important question, why we suffer, which is an assessment of the biblical views of suffering. We have tsunamis, we have massive starvations, we have natural disasters, we have war, uh, you can name famine, drought, these events that are occurring on daily basis in our lives which produce suffering as far as the human beings are concerned and the animals why is it happening that misunderstanding or the inability to understand had led many people to divert from the path but we will see that actually it's not the case it's a very simple subject matter if some fundamentals are understood first. He's currently the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Religious Studies 
at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's a very prestigious st status. He received both his Masters of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, where his 1985 doctoral dissertation was awarded magna cum laude. This is a particular term in the Christian world that this is very unique, distinguished. Not your average scholar, not your average scholar. Among his fields of scholarly expertise are the historical Jesus, the early Christian Apocrypha, the Apostolic Fathers, and the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Actually, he learned the Greek language in order to study the Greek manuscripts, which are the first manuscripts of the New Testament. There are no other, the first manuscripts that were written for the New Testament were written in Greek. And that's the only thing that they have available. And he studied the language in order to understand the true message and how it was translated into the languages that we have today. We will see how this is all related to our discussion tonight. For most of his life, he was a devout Christian, believing in God, trusting in Christ for salvation, knowing that God was actively involved in this world. Actually, at the age of 16, he quoted that he had a born-again experience, which is feeling uh, the feeling of some Christians that they were filled by the Holy Ghost, or that Jesus came into their lives, and it's like a, a spiritual awakening. And so he had that particular experience, and he became what they consider a fundamentalist in Christianity. Uh, and he was following this way of life for many years. But things changed. When asked, is the Bible the word of God? He, this is a, a professor of the Bible. Okay, he teaches students the biblical studies. He said, which Bible? Is it the Bible that you buy in your local bookstore? Is it the Bible found in manuscripts? If in manuscripts, which manuscripts? Now this is the man who knows. This is the person of experience. Telling you if you're talking about the book, the Bible, if you go to the bookstore and buy it, if you think that this is the Bible, is this the word of God, then you need to reconsider that. Okay, so you want to go back to the manuscripts, that's fine. Which manuscripts? There are over 200,000, no two are identical. No two are identical. So you don't know which one is from God versus which one is from man. And that creates a problem for you to use this as a reference for guidance. And we will see how this is not the case with the noble Quran that Allah has blessed us with. So he later became an agnostic because he couldn't find the answer to another question. And we will see what agnostic means. He's one who disclaims any knowledge of God but does not deny the possibility of God's existence. Basically, he doesn't say that there's a God because he's not sure. But he doesn't go to the extreme of the atheists who say there's no God for sure. Okay, so the atheists say there's absolutely no God. Agnostic does not affirm what the believers in the deity affirm. But on the other hand, he does not deny the possibility of the existence of God. But he's not sure. So this man, who was a devout Christian, living his life accordingly, studying the scriptures, it led him to losing faith altogether. And so now, he calls himself a happy agnostic. He doesn't know whether there's a God or not. He's not sure. But he says, but if there's a God, if there's a God, it is definitely not the one that we learn from the Bible. Not the one that is taught according to the Jews and the Christians. Which is another closer step to us. I, when I first heard about this, I'm like, the next thing you expect is this person to become a Muslim. Because these are the steps that usually take you to Islam. When you start realizing that the religion that you've been following is man-made, and then you look around for a religion that is not man-made, the only religion that you will find is Islam. And so we're anticipating that, and we're trying to make it easy for him tonight. Hopefully that he will eventually hear this, and realize that if he's been looking for the truth, as he said, then the truth has always been around. You just have to look a little closer, and we will try to facilitate that by giving him some answers which he was unable to find through his mission. The question was that made him leave Christianity. 
How could there be a God when there is so much suffering in the world? Okay? We will see how that could be. How could one explain these statements altogether? One, God is all-powerful. Does everyone agree? Yes. Everyone agree God is all-powerful? Next, God is all-loving. Yes. We will see. Hey, we will see because that has a whole other connotation in the Christian world, which we don't have in the Muslim world, but your answer is pretty close. There's a potential for that. But we'll see what happens to some human beings. Thirdly, there's suffering. And we all agree that there's suffering. Just right now, if you go to the news, the typhoon that has hit China and Taiwan, and people are, you know, have lost their homes. Thousands of people are misplaced. And, you know, there's a disaster going on in the, in the world right now. Besides the wars and everything else. So suffering is going on. No one can deny that. So how can one say there's an all-powerful God who can change things, all-loving, who wants to change things and still they're suffering. Okay? Sounds difficult, but it's not. So Ehrman's inability to reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of real life led him to reject Christianity. God's problem. In his book, God's Problem, Ehrman discusses his own personal distress on the Bible's explanations and a few versions from various philosophers and email correspondents as to why God allows or even mandates suffering. It's a huge book, it's a bestseller, and he goes into the intricate details of the subject matter. His own views, those provided by the Bible, other people advising him, emailing him, listen man, this is why, this is why. He brought everything together and he was unsatisfied. He was still unsatisfied. But we will see about that as well. So there's a need to answer the question for those genuinely seeking that answer. Whether it is Professor Bart or otherwise. Why? Because Allah says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن, مصيب من مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ No disaster strikes except by permission of Allah. And whoever believes in Allah, he will guide his heart. And Allah is knowing of all things. Subhanallah. This summarizes the whole problem. No disaster happens except by the permission of Allah. If you believe, Allah will guide your heart. You won't have a problem. If you believe. If you don't believe, problems will arise. So we will try to bring belief to those who, look in, who are looking for belief, and Allah is the one who guides. A tree. The tree, wa alaykum salam, is made up of uh, the roots and the branches. The trunk of the tree and the branches. This issue of suffering is a side issue. It's a branch. And one cannot understand it unless one understands the root okay no matter what kind of answers we give they may be unsatisfactory to the person who does not understand the foundations so before we deal with the side issue we must go back to the foundations before we deal with the side issue we must go back to the foundations what are the foundations What if you find a watch in the sand? You're walking down the beach, huh? And you find a watch. What is the first thing that comes to mind? One of two things. One is a logical answer, and the other one is an illogical answer. Although the atheists claim otherwise. Logically, the illogical, let's begin with the illogical. The illogical is, whoa, how in the world did this watch come here? Huh? How did it come together? Was it manufactured by chance? Was there an explosion up in the skies and then a, a, a watch came about? 
and it just happens to be lying on the beach. Now, this is, we, we say this is illogical. Even if it happened a million times, million explosions, that will never happen. Logically, you will say, I wonder who was here and who forgot or dropped or lost his watch. No human being can deny that, logically speaking. So we're saying this because we're trying to say, look, to say that there may be a God or there may be the non-existence of God is something that is nonsensical slash illogical. Look at the creation. If you refuse to believe that a watch came into existence by mere chance, then how can one look around him, see everything and the way the universe is functioning, including yourself, you the son of Adam, this complicated, sophisticated machine that does not need batteries or electricity or anything of this nature. How you function, how you move, how you understand, how you see, how you hear. How could this come into existence without an originator, without a designer for the design? We say this is illogical. So then there must be a creator. There must be a creator. It's impossible according to all, even Plato and Aristotle. These are the most famous philosophers. They argued that there must be a God. The most famous philosophers which people follow their footsteps to de deny God, they themselves concluded that there's no way that there's not a God. Now they didn't believe in God Islamically, they didn't have the right belief system, Tawheed, but they said, look, there must be a God. And so we say to anyone who has some sort of doubt, how is it possible that everything came into existence without a manufacturer? If your cell phone, if your recorder, if a pen cannot suddenly exist without someone who is designing it, then obviously and more likely the rest of the creation cannot be brought into existence by mere chance, whether you call it the Big, big Bang Theory or anything else. Planets cannot collide or some energy ball cannot explode and bring about all of us. Is it possible? It's impossible. So that must be understood as a foundation. Before we deal with suffering, we must first acknowledge that there's a God. And if there's a God, then there's more to it. Allah, the Almighty, the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where from? Where did you come from? Am khuliku min ghayri shay'in? Am humul khaliqoon? Or were they created by nothing? Or are they the creators of themselves? This ayah in the book of Allah does away with all the misunderstandings. One of two options, my friend. Either you created yourself, and no one can say that, or you were created by nothing, and that's impossible. Because for nothing, to create you, it must exist. So we can no longer call it nothing. It's something then. So then we, there must be a God. There must be a creator. There must be one who fashioned you in the way that you are. And if this is the case, then you should expect some more steps. Where? Where are you going? There must be a way of life, a code of conduct. And this, the example that is given by many of the du'at, which is very practical. Imagine, excuse me, that somebody uh, builds a hospital, all right? Then he hires a number of employees, just a bunch of employees without telling them what their particular jobs are. Okay, you're just hired. Now, furthermore, this hospital does not have a goal. It does not have an objective to fulfill. Serving patients is not something that was thought of when the, that when the hospital was constructed, when the, when the rooms and the surgery rooms and all the machinery were brought. There was no thought of what we will do with that. And then employees were brought without being told what their jobs are. What do you think will happen in this kind of hospital? The employees come to work every day, say, hey, what are you doing here? I don't know. 
What are you doing here? I don't know. They hired me. Are you a doctor? Maybe. Maybe not. You're a nurse. Perhaps. Possible. What do you do here? I don't know. You get paid? For sure. I got my salary at the end of the month. So where's the cafeteria? Oh, let's go have some tea. No patients. The hospital didn't have a goal to serve patients, to treat ill people. So the doors are not open for anyone to come for treatment. So you have ill people outside, hospital open, employees are in, and nobody knows what's going on. How would you feel about the person behind this idea? The manager, the director, the owner of the hospital. We say he's, you know, he's he went on khuruj bidun awda. Exit visa, hasn't been back since. Gone. What do you mean? How is it possible that you make a hospital, you get all these people, you pay money and, and no objective, no job description? Impossible. So if we believe that there's a God, which we do, is it possible that He will create us and not have a purpose for our life? And then not give us a job description, which is religion? It's impossible. And if one believes that, then one is attributing lack of wisdom to God. He's calling God unwise. And Allah Azza wa Jal is all wise, not unwise. So there must be then a way of life. There must be a purpose for this life. Where are we going? To the life to come. How are you going to get there? There must be a religion from God, not from us, that tells you what you need to do, what you need to leave alone, just like your job. This is what we have business for. We are here to serve patients. You're a doctor, you're supposed to do A, B, C, D, and you're supposed to leave alone one, two, three. Without that, without that, you don't have a job. And you will not be able to carry out your job. And there will be chaos and confusion. And if we don't accept and we refuse to attribute that to a human being, then it is, it is very unlikely that one will say that God created us and then left us alone. Left us just to live life according to our own ways and there's nothing to come in the hereafter and there's no particular way of life that has been ordained by Him. This is impossible. And if one understands that, then one will be able to understand that which is less complicated. Because this is one of the most simple matters in the whole world. Why in order to establish worship of that God? That God that deserves your worship? By Him creating you, He has the ultimate authority over your life. You have no authority over your own life. He did not leave you unattended. Rather, He, through His mercy, told you exactly what you need to do so you may enter eternal paradise and enjoy everlasting bliss, mercy, and love from God. This is why. So you could do the job and get your salary. Or you could slack around and you'll be laid off. That's how it is done in this life, and that's how it will be done in the life to come. Either you do the job, you'll be paid your salary, or you slack off and you'll be laid off. No salary for you, and they will replace you with another employee who will take the job seriously. Logic logical and straight to the point. Doesn't need a philosopher to sit here and break it down for anyone. Anyone sitting here logically agrees with that because this is part of your natural disposition. Allah created us in this fashion. We tend to incline towards such information because we have been programmed to do so. So it is very subtle, very acceptable, and very entertaining as well. Not for everyone, but for us it is. So Islam then is the to completely and willingly submit to the code of conduct ordained by Allah. And we said Islam comes from yastaslim, in a sense to surrender or submit. You submit your will to the will of God. And when we say the will of God, we're speaking about the God that we learn from the revelation of God, which is the Quran, not any other one. Because the concept of God, depending on the people and their faith and their religion, varies a lot. To some people, God is a cow. To others, God is a monkey. To others, God is a statue. To others, is Jesus the son of Mary. Peace be upon him. And the list goes on. 
So we're not talking about that God. We're talking about the true God. The creator, the sustainer, the cherisher, the evolver of the heavens and the earth. The one who made everything in the fashion that it is. The one who deserves all praise and all thanks are due to him. The one that everyone depends on and he is independent of all. He doesn't need anyone and everyone needs him. That is the one we're speaking about. And Islam is a complete way of life based upon a voluntary relationship between man and his creator. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَن يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهِ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And whoever desires other than Islam as a way of life, never will it be accepted from him, and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. And this message I send out to anyone who will see this tonight or in the future. Allah will not accept anything but His way, not our way. And His way is the way of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jana, Job, every prophet and messenger, Jesus and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah send His peace and His blessings upon all of them. That way of life. We're not saying that all those who came after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu are included. We're saying anyone who followed the respective messenger during his time and believed in the oneness of God is included among the Muslim Ummah in a sense that they submitted to Allah. So this is the only religion which Allah will accept. Adam, peace be upon him, was upon that religion. His children were upon his religion and his descendants continue to be upon his religion in the different forms that it came until it was finalized by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the way that we have it today. And one must accept that in order to be on the path to salvation and paradise. Anything other than that, it will not be accepted because we are trying to worship God on our own terms not on his terms, and that doesn't work. You don't get hired by a company, and you are the employee, and you go tell the boss, listen, I'm gonna tell you how we do business, okay? You listen to me, you be quiet, you sit down over here, I do the job. I will I tell you, this is how we do this, this is how we contact that, say, listen man, if we needed a manager, we would have hired a manager. We wanted an employee to send out emails. So kindly go behind your PC and send out emails. Get out of my office now. Some people get big headed. huh? I'm gonna tell him how to do it. I'm gonna, no one can tell God how he should worship him or what to believe in him or what we attribute to him. This is not of our business, none of our business. And we don't have any power, authority or anything of this nature which allows us to tell God what we are supposed to believe and what we are supposed to do. Rather, this has to come from Him because we are the servants and He is the master. That's just the way it is. Some people dislike that, we love it. We love being servants of Allah because every one of the children of Adam is a servant of something. It could be a false God, it could be a true God. And the Muslims are the servants of the true God and the rest of the people are the servants of their own gods. Whether they are man-made or even one's personal opinion and desires. Allah told us, Have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his Lord? One may take his own self as a God by obeying everything his mind tells him to do and disregarding revelation from God. So in this sense, he became his own God. So people are inevitably servants of something. So what will be, what will be pleasing to the person on the day of judgment is being a servant of the one who deserves servitude. And this is the condition of the Muslim with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran, you see, the book misquoting Jesus dealt with all of the problems and the contradictions that are found in the Bible. And this was when Professor Bart Ehrman started to drift away from his faith. This is when he started to lose faith. He lost his faith completely with the idea of why we suffer, right? But before that, he had issues with what the Bible was teaching because he was reading the manuscripts, okay, of the Gospels and he was finding information there. He was finding information in the current day Bible in English that was not there in the Greek manuscripts. And the only references and sources that they have 
for the current day English Bible are the Greek manuscripts for the New Testament. So how can you have something in the Bible today which is supposed to be based on the New Testament, on the Greek manuscripts, and you don't have that information in the very manuscript. You see what I'm saying? Like the story of the woman, the adulteress, who was brought to Jesus, and they said, you know, he said, let the first, let the one of you who has no sin be the first to stone her, supposedly. That story, which is very famously quoted, is not part of the original testament. It's not part of the New Testament. It is not in the Greek manuscripts, but it is found in the New Testament today. So these made him pay attention to the fact the more he, the more he studied in depth the, the Bible and the manuscripts, the more he started to realize that there has been some changes. And that the Bible that the people have today is not the same, uh, is not according to the original Greek manuscripts. He started to drift from faith because of that. Now we don't have that in the Quran and we will see why. First, the Quran is a divine miracle of literature in terms of authorship, prophecy, science, history, legislations, preservations, etc. We can go into embryology and other fields of science which prove that the Quran is unmatched. Unmatched, we don't have this issue of the uh, manuscripts and the original manuscripts because we have the Quran in the language of Revelation. And if Professor Bart was to take that path in life and study the Quran because of his field of expertise, then he will come to this realization. Because many people have done so before and they came to the same realization. That this Quran is from God, is unchanged, it is according to the way it was revealed in the language of Revelation. Jesus didn't speak English. And if someone called him Jesus during his time, he wouldn't turn around. And if they called him anything else, he wouldn't turn around. And in Hebrew, his name is Esau, which is closest thing to Isa. So Jesus was, is Latinized, they added the J because they love to add a J. Jose, you know, it's a whole other thing in the language. Ideally, this was something that was not there then. And so the changes were made. This is not the case with the Quran. We have it in the language of Revelation. It is preserved 100% in the original language for over 1400 years. And we all know the challenge. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَن تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ It's a challenge, man. This challenge, I challenge anyone to bring a challenge like that challenge. This challenge that Allah gave in the Quran, I confused you, huh? No one can make this challenge. I challenge anyone to write a book. You write a book. And in the beginning of your book you say, I challenge anyone to write one sentence like my book. One sentence, one page like my book. And if any, no one will ever be able to do it. Have you ever seen a book written in this fashion? The first page that you read on any book, if there are any errors, please email us. Huh? If there are any mistakes that you will find, we apologize. Huh? Inform us. Nobody will come with this kind of arrogance because as soon as someone meets that challenge, that person will be disgraced. If he says in his book, I challenge anyone to write one page like me, and then the very next day his neighbor, who lives right next to him, which he didn't know about, writes something that is much more eloquent than him, then everybody's gonna laugh at him. Say, see man, you brought something, man, you said no, this is a challenge, look at this man, your stuff sucks. <laughs> yes, I won't even read this again. Look at your neighbor, beautiful writing. Why? Because this is a very serious matter, to come and say, well, nobody can write like me. Even Shakespeare couldn't have said that back then because they are those who are more eloquent. So who can have such authority to make this particular challenge? The Creator, Allah. Allah says in the Quran, interpretation of the meaning in English, if you are in doubt concerning that which we have sent down upon our servant, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then produce a chapter the like thereof. Now who knows what the smallest chapter in the Quran is? Surah Al-Kawthar. 
How many words? Ten. Ten. You memorize it from last time. Inna a'tayna kal kawthar fasalli li rabbika wanhar inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. Ten words, three verses, a line and a half. Allah says, if you are in doubt about this Quran, produce a chapter like it. Like that, a line and a half. Not only that, وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And call on to your witnesses, everybody upon earth, human and jinn, besides Allah, if you are truthful. That's the challenge. Now, how long did it take for the answer to come? The very next verse. It's conclusive, man. It's a case closed that no one can open again. And 1400 years into that challenge, you are living it today. It's a case that has been closed that no one can open. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا And if you're unable to do it, and you will never be able to do it. فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ Then protect yourselves from the hellfire. Did you hear that? If you're unable to do it, and you will never be able to do it. وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا You are living this challenge today. No one can write this. No one can reveal this, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where are the poets? Where are the poets among the Arabs? Many non-Arab, uh, non-Muslim Arabs. You ask, you know around. Many, many of them were eloquent individuals. They wrote books and poetry. Any one of them could have been able to come up with one, a line, a line and a half, and end this whole Islam. You see, Islam would have been over if somebody met the challenge of Allah. But subhanallah, subhanallah, no one has been able to do it. No one will even dare to try because people are going to laugh at them. And I remember when one of these funny individuals who used to debate with some of the Muslims, he brought a, a book that he said that actually they met the challenge. Some, some Christians, you know, Arabs came together and they put it together and they, they came up with the, supposedly what they call the Quran. And when he recited it in front of the people, people were laughing. The crowd were having a great time laughing. It's like, this is so funny. You trying to tell me that this is like the Quran? It's so weak that the only thing you could do is laugh. That they even thought that this was anywhere near the revelation which Allah sent down from above the seven heavens. That's the Quran. If one does not understand that, one cannot understand side issues. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Indeed, it is we who send down the Qur'an and indeed, we will be its guardian and it has been guarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Then do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction, which is exactly what Professor Bart Ehrman found in the Bible. He found contradiction, which you cannot find in the Quran. And Allah told us that if you want to know whether the book is from God or not, look at the contradictions. Look at the Quran. If you will reflect upon it, you will find that there is no contradiction because it is from Allah. Had it been from other than Allah, like the Bible that we have today, then, it w then you will find therein much contradiction. Now, we don't deny the gospel of Jesus, peace be upon him. The Injil of Isa, alayhi salatu salam, we believe. But show it to me. Show me the gospel of Jesus. No one has it. No one has it. They have the Old Testament. They have the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. We have their letters that, wrote, that Paul wrote. We have no thing in the Bible called the gospel of Jesus, which is what we Muslims believe in. Had it been around, then we will say, okay, this is from God. Had it been around and preserved, but Allah decreed that this is not the case. The only book which He decreed will be preserved is the Quran, because it is the final revelation through the final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran is a book which provides the human being the spiritual and intellectual nourishment he or she need or needs. This is the book about which there is no doubt, a guidance for those conscious of Allah. So the way it is put is the following. The Quran is guidance for everyone, but not everyone is qualified for guidance. The Quran is guidance for anyone, 
but not everyone is qualified for guidance. Some people just don't meet the requirements to be guided because of some wickedness within, because of some deviation within, because of some arrogance, pride, rejection within. You can't do nothing about that. There's nothing you can do about that. This is from one's internal feelings and emotions and ideologies. You have no authority over that. You can only deliver the information. It is Allah who guides those who seek guidance inevitably. Let me share with you what Ali radiallahu anhu arda. He's the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said concerning the Quran. Very beautiful. He said, it's the book of God. In it is the record of what was before you, the prophets and the messengers and everything else. The judgment of what is among you, how to deal with our problems and differences in this current day and time. And the prophecies of what will come after you, many of which have been fulfilled by the grace of Allah. It is decisive, not a case for levity. Whoever is a tyrant and ignores the Quran will be destroyed by God. Whoever seeks guidance from other than, from other than it will be misguided. You seek guidance from other than the Quran, you will definitely go astray. And we have a practical example that we have been dealing with right now. When people try to find guidance in other than the book of Allah, they lost faith altogether. They lost faith in God altogether. This is not the case with the Quran. It guided all of you, mashallah, tabarakallah, to the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all praises due to Allah. The Quran is the unbreakable bond of connection with God. It is the remembrance full of wisdom and the straight path. The Quran does not become distorted by tongues, nor can, be, nor can it be deviated by caprices. It never dulls from repeated study. You don't get bored of it. Scholars will always want more of it. The wonders of the Quran are never ending. Whosoever speaks from it will speak the truth. Whoever rules with it will be just. And whoever holds fast to it will be guided to the straight path. This shows you the understanding of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa concerning the Quran. Many of us will not be able to put it in this way even if we try to. But because of their understanding of the Quran and the virtue of this book which Allah has given the creation, some of which were guided with this book and others have turned their backs and so they were led astray accordingly. If the Quran is the authority which we have proven, then the only way we can tackle this problem of why we suffer is from the Quran. The Quran and the Sunnah that is, because the Sunnah completes the Quran. They are both revelation of Allah. So this is very fundamental. In order for us to tackle this issue of why we suffer, we first, we first must agree to the foundations. The foundations is that Allah exists, He created us, Islam is the way of life, and the Quran is the book of revelation that is preserved. If this is the case, then we cannot possibly answer these questions without referring to God Himself. And Allah had told us in the Quran clearly why there is suffering. And He told us that suffering shall take place. And this is the first example. And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. Allah told us that this will happen, so you shouldn't have a problem. But give good tidings to the patient. Those who are patient, who have perseverance at the time of the calamity. What is their condition? Those who when disaster strikes them say, indeed we belong to Allah, and indeed to him we will return. They understood the questions which we dealt with earlier. From where did we come? And where are we going? They understood that. So they said, Inna lillah. We belong to Allah. And to him we shall return. So he does what he wills. If we are patient, then this calamity will become means of success for you. The very calamity will become salvation and means of success for you. But if you are impatient, and if you don't believe, then the calamity will be double. The calamity that you're suffering from and the calamity of not being able to adequately deal with the calamity. And then you have people committing suicide, losing faith, and doing a number of things which are not befitting for the children of Adam. Now I want to comment on the statement of Professor Bart. 
and we wish him all good and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him to Islam. He said God's problem, the book, he, he named this book, God's problem, how the Bible fails to answer the most uh, important question, why we suffer. Now, we have a strong reservation as Muslims to say that God has a problem. Okay? God has no problems, we have problems. The children of Adam may have a problem understanding something about God. But trust me, God has no problems whatsoever. Because if God had a problem, He's no longer God. You see what I'm saying? If God had a problem, He's no longer God. If your kafil doesn't have an iqama, or if he doesn't have a hawiyah, He can't be your kafil, man. Both of you will be out of the country. I mean, that's just common sense. If he has a problem, I'm sorry, I give you, you know, practical examples from daily experiences, maybe, you know. Reality is, how can you say God has a problem? I mean, it, it cannot be. Now, he's not sure whether there's God or not. So for others who say that God has a problem, I tell you, God does not have a problem whatsoever. So why they say that? Because there is no evil in the decree of Allah, the way we answer that. There is no evil in the decree of Allah, rather the evil is in the aftermath of the decree. The Prophet wasallam said, وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ And evil is not attributable to you. We cannot attribute evil to God. This particular understanding means, although Allah created good and evil, but we do not say that any action or the decree of Allah in and within itself is evil. This can never be the case because Allah is good and evil comes from those who are evil and Allah is all good. So evil cannot come from one who is all good. But what we say in the aftermath, there are things that appear to be evil, but they are always associated with goodness. They may appear to be evil in some aspect. But goodness is also there. Some people recognize that, some people don't. And we could give hundreds of examples. Your son, may Allah protect your children, a boy winds up being bit by a snake. And the poison is about to go through his blood and terminate him. So then the doctor says we must amputate his arm. Cut it off. Now, if somebody came to you, said, brother, how are you today? May I cut your arm off? What do you say? No. How about your son? Do you mind if I chop your, your son's arm off? Say, man, this is evil. Why would you do that? So your perception now that this is evil, no one will deny that. Okay. But in the case of that snake biting the son, that young boy, and the amputation of the arm becomes means for him to survive. For him to remain alive. We say, although the act of amputating the arm is evil, but goodness lies within. Goodness, and goodness is also there. But you have to look at it. You have to broaden your scope. You can't be looking at a limited aspect of life. Is that clear? So then, whatever there, whenever there's evil, there's also good. There's also good. Whether you recognize it or not, this is a whole nother discussion. The inability to recognize the good does not mean that it does not exist. And we will deal with more practical examples later on in this particular lecture. But the concluding statement is, we don't attribute evil to God. Rather we say that in what God created, there are things that appear to be evil, but there's also goodness. And sometimes evil is necessary for goodness to be appreciated. Sometimes you will not appreciate the beauty unless there's ugliness. You will not appreciate the good person unless you come across many bad people. If everybody was good, then there's no virtue for the good person. But when there's good people and bad people, then you will appreciate the good person. So the existence of evil and good simultaneously is from the wisdom of God. So you will recognize the truth and appreciate it. Recognize goodness and appreciate it and then stay away from evil. This is wisdom and this is only fair that we live life in this particular fashion. Allah says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. 
Corruption has appeared throughout the land and sea by what the hands of people have earned. So he may let them taste part of the consequence of what they have done that perhaps they will return to righteousness. So then Allah explained in this particular ayah that this evil that you see is because of you and me and the rest of the creation. Adam was in Jannah. Adam alayhi salatu salam and Eve, they were in paradise. There was no suffering. There was no nothing. When disobedience took place, which Allah forgave, alhamdulillah, and He made Adam a prophet afterwards. But when that occurred, then this occurred as a byproduct of that earlier event. So then whatever you see of evil is because of what we are earning as the children of Adam. Had the people been righteous, then it would be as Allah says in the Quran, that Allah would have sent down the barakat and the abundance of goodness upon us. They will be, and this is why when Jesus, peace be upon him, will come towards the end of time and he will establish justice, there will be no more oppression. Hundreds of people will eat from one fruit because of the blessings that Allah will place in the earth therein. There will be no one who will accept charity because no one will need it. When? When Jesus, peace be upon him, will come back as we Muslims believe and he will establish justice and all the evil people will be gone. When evil will, will end, then also suffering will end. So suffering is a byproduct of our actions. This must be understood. Answering unsatisfying answers. In a radio interview that Professor Bart Ehrman had with some lady named Jerry Gross on some radio station, she actually had a maybe a 50 minute interview with him concerning his book, God's Problem, where they both went over the various answers provided by the various people, whether biblically or from other religions or philosophers about why they're suffering. They both discussed them and every time she will present one to him or he will tell her one that was mentioned in his book, he then told her why he was unsatisfied with that answer. Okay? So they wind up dealing with a number of them. The conclusion was he's still agnostic because no answer was satisfying enough for him. So we will try to answer them, those answers that were unsatisfying, we will give the Islamic perspective of those to prove that they are beyond satisfying. They're more than satisfactory, bi-idhnillahi azza wa jal. So let's answer them. The first answer given by, whether biblically or otherwise, free will, the free will of the children of Adam. God created us and gave us the ability to obey or disobey, right or wrong? Everybody has a right, has the free will to either obey God or disobey God. No one is forced to do salah and no one is forced to prostrate to a statue or idol. This is something that the human beings were given. So it was said to him, because of the free will, we see suffering, right? So if there's a free will and this country wants to wage war against another country, then you will see suffering in the other country because these people have the free will to wage war. Is that clear? So that is a pretty convincing answer. But Professor Bart said, and I will put those in blue, this is his answer, that does not explain natural disasters. He said, yes, if you have a free will, and this country wages war against the other. That was not the example they gave. I'm given that. That's because of free will. Okay, what does that have to do with a tornado? Suffering through a tornado has nothing to do with people oppressing one another. It is something that is strictly natural. So Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ and whatever of misfortune befalls you, it is because of what your hands have earned and he pardons much. Meaning that free will is the very thing that produces the natural disasters. You see, if the Quran is an authority, then this is the satisfying or satisfactory answer. Yes, you may say that free will does not explain natural disasters if you don't go back to the Quran. But according to the Quran, Whatever be calamity befalls you, whether from the heavens or from the earth, earthquakes, tornadoes, it is still because of the free will. People disobeying God and committing evil upon earth. That's the first. The second, 
The lady told them, Miss Gross, she said, we don't understand God. It just, God is beyond us. So you trying to explain, you know, or try to understand why we suffer is, is, uh, is pointless because God is beyond your understanding. So he said, okay, then according to you, then you're saying that it's a mystery. Why we suffer is a mystery. And a mystery does not solve it for me. It is not satisfying to me. There must be no mystery, it must be clear. We say as Muslims, yes, we don't understand Allah in the ultimate sense. And they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills, right or wrong. But he willed to tell me and you and the rest of the creation why we suffer. Yes, he is beyond our comprehension in a sense. If he did not tell us, but concerning why we suffer, we already quoted some ayat, and we will quote some other ayat and narrations to prove that even though God is beyond our comprehension as far as human intellect, He had given us an answer, it's no longer a mystery. It's no longer a mystery. That's the second. Third, God punishes for sins. The fact that because people sin, people suffer accordingly. Professor Bart said, but the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. If you look at life, you see some of the most wicked people. Also has a casino, right? You know, in the casino, all kinds of evil is taking place. And the guy is living a lavish life. He got his yacht, he's got his big house, he's, he's having a great time. And he's one of the most wicked people upon earth. And then you find a righteous man trying to, you know, be good, suffering from car accidents, death of children, and so on and so forth. So he said, if it is only a punishment for sins, then how is it that the righteous are suffering and the wicked are prospering? Again, we will say, Allah told us that this will be the case. The fact that a good person is suffering does not mean that he is being punished for sin. Rather, this may mean that Allah wants to raise him in degree. Allah wants to honor him as he did with the prophets and the messengers. So this kind of suffering that they undergo is in order for them to be enhanced, for their status to be enhanced among the creation. Secondly, we follow the prophets and the messengers as examples. So we find solace in them. When we suffer, we remember the suffering of the prophets and the messengers that makes it easier for us to endure suffering as well. Allah says, انظر كيف فضلنا بعضهم على بعض ولا الآخرة أكبر درجات وأكبر تفضيلا Look how we have favored in provision some of them over others but the hereafter is greater in degrees of difference and greater in distinction. So Allah told us in the Quran that He has favored people some over others and He made it general. Then in the next ayah Allah explained to us مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعَاجِلَةَ عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ لِمَنْ نُرِيدُ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمَ يَصْلَاهَا مَذْمُومًا مَدْحُورًا Whoever should desire the immediate life, the immediate quick, transitory life, who, uh, we hasten for him, we readily give him from, what, from, from it what we will to whom we intend. A lot of money burning. Then we have made for him hell which he will enter to burn, censored, and banished. So Allah told us that those wicked that you see prosper prospering, they're only being given what they want. Allah said, whoever wants the quick passing life, we will readily give him whatever we want to whomever we will. You want to have a casino? You want to make a lot of money, live a lavish life? Allah may give you this life. But in the hereafter, the hellfire. That's what it is. So then Allah told us, there's no problem anymore saying, well, how come the wicked are prospering? Allah told us that He will allow them to do so. He will allow them to do so. Because they are opposed with another group of people. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا But whoever desires the hereafter and exerts the effort due to it, while he's a believer, you must be a believer. It is those whose effort is ever appreciated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then the righteous may suffer. He may suffer because he wants the life to come. And Allah will appreciate that. And he will give them accordingly on the day of judgment. So we can no longer say that there's a problem with the wicked uh, prospering and the righteous suffering because Allah told us in the Quran that the situation is as such. 
and it depends on whether you believe and what your intentions are. If you look for the hereafter, then you will be, it will be a win-win situation for you. Next, the, another ayah which prove our case. فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَةً فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْلِسُونَ Look how clear the teachings of the Qur'an are. So when they forgot that by which they had been reminded to believe in Allah and follow the footsteps of the prophets and the messengers, we opened to them the doors of everything good. We gave them abundance of wealth until when they rejoiced in that which they were given, we seized them suddenly and they were then in despair. They were given and then they were treated accordingly and every natural disaster that you see today in this world, you will find that it is predominantly amongst people who have been transgressing and violating the limitations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Countries where it is common for people to be idol worshippers and be upon being upon a faith other than the true faith or even Muslims who have been disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is means for Allah to expiate their sins as we will prove later. Fourthly, redemptive. Suffering is actually redemptive. He said, Professor Bart, massive starvation is not redemptive in any way. Redemptive means through the suffering of some, something good is attained. There's redemption therein. He said, how can you explain the redemption through massive starvation? You go to Africa and you find every five seconds, basically statistically speaking, every five seconds a, a child dies from starvation. So we say, he's saying, how can that be redemptive? In what way that can be redemptive? Well, we have an answer for that as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, Trials will continue to befall the believing man or woman in himself, his child and his wealth until he meets Allah with no sin on him. It is redemptive. But what is the point of emphasis here? Are you a believer or not? That's the whole thing. When a disaster strikes, either you are a believer and so this is redemption for you or you're not, then this is equal recompense. If we understood this, we will not have a problem. It is redemptive for the believer, but for the disbelievers, it is simply what they have been striving for. It is an equal recompense from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said in another narration, when Allah wills good for a slave, He hastens the punishment for him in this world. And when Allah wills ill for a slave, he withholds the punishment for his sins from him until he comes with all his sins on the day of judgment. Until he comes with all his sins on the day of judgment. So if Allah intends goodness for you, you will be afflicted with the calamity. Because this will be means of redemption for your sins. So the point that is not being understood then among the agnostics is the fact that this is all relevant to whether you are a believer or not. And we said that part of the purpose of life is that you have been created to believe. So when you don't believe, you are destroying the objective of life. You should not be expecting any blessings from God. This is just an equal. The Prophet ﷺ said to confirm that point, the believer is not harmed by a thorn or anything greater, even a thorn, even a needle that pokes your finger, but Allah will raise him in status thereby and erase the sin thereby. So according to the Islamic teachings, it is redemptive. It is redemptive. But you must be a believer first to receive the redemption. If you don't believe, then there will be, be no redemption for you. The story of Job in the Bible is corrupted. Among the things that uh, Miss Jerry discussed with Professor Bart Ehrman is the story of Job. And Job in Arabic is Ayyub alayhi salatu salam. And so in the Bible it quotes a story and Basically, in the middle of the story, in the book of Job in the Bible, it says that Job became upset with God. And he was displeased with, the, with what was afflicted, what he was afflicted with. And he would challenge God and it, it says a number of things about Job, which Bart Ehrman himself rejected and we as Muslims reject as well. Because uh, the one that the story found in the Bible is not the real story of Job. The real one is the one that we have in the Quran. 
Allah says wa ayyuba id nada rabbahu anni massani yadur wa anta arhamur rahimin and mention when job and mention job when he called to his lord indeed adversity has touched me and you are the most merciful of the merciful then Allah told us next fastajabna lahu fakashafna ma bihi min dur wa atainahu ahlahu wa mithlahum ma'ahum rahmatan min indina wa dhikra lil abidin so we responded to him and removed what afflicted him of adversity and we gave him back his family and the like thereof with them as mercy from us and a reminder for the worshippers of Allah. This is the, stu the true story of Job. He did not complain, he was patient and we know that the patience of Ayyub alayhi salatu salam was great. He was patient, he was not displeased with Allah, so that cannot be used as means of blaming God for the problem because the biblical narrative is unauthentic. But the Quranic one, which has been preserved by Allah, is the correct one. The sixth view, the apocalyptic view, the apocalyptic view, which basically the, def the definition is the forces of evil are behind everything that you see. And God currently has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. But He will intervene towards the end of time and destroy the forces of evil. So this view that is biblical, actually it is the one that is attributed mostly to Jesus, is the fact that every evil you see is because God allowed the forces of evil to control the earth and the universe. And He is, he is not involved He's not active in this transaction, but he will intervene towards the end of time in order to save humanity. Okay? Bart, uh, Professor Bart said, uh, people have been waiting for this event according to biblical prophecies, yet nothing has happened. Actually, according to the prophecies in the Bible, Jesus told his disciples, before you die, it's going to happen. This God intervening and saving the creation in the day of judgment, apocalypse. huh? According to the biblical teachings, Jesus was telling his disciples, this generation will not end before this will happen. And so for 1400, for how many years? Two, 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 two centuries, 20 centuries. People have been waiting for the fulfillment of the prophecy and it's never been fulfilled. And Professor Bard himself is saying, we've been waiting for this reality to take place and nothing has happened. Where is they intervene? Where, where, when did God intervene and destroy the forces of evil? Where is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus in the Bible? It has never happened. So due to that, that was rejected. We say, we agree with you. Alhamdulillah, we agree with you. Allah says in the Quran, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَا يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ There's no such thing that evil is controlling the world. No disaster strikes except by permission of Allah. And whoever believes in Allah, we dealt with this, will guide his heart and Allah's knowing of all things. So there's no such thing as the forces of evil are controlling the world and God is independent. He's outside of the picture. On the contrary, nothing, whether good or what appears to be evil to the people, nothing happens except by the permission of Allah. So this apocalyptic view is rejected both according to Professor Bart Ehrman and according to the Muslims simultaneously. Next, the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, this is a book in the Bible which basically propagates the teaching that everything is vanity. Vanity. Meaning everything is pointless. Why work? Why work? You will die. Why make money? Your children will inherit you. Why worry about the hereafter? Everything will come to an end. This kind of lazy approach that everything is vain, everything is in vain. It's just a bunch of vanity. There's nothing beyond that. And actually this is the one that Professor Bart leans towards the most. This is the one that he agrees with the most. So enjoy life, however, help others. We say, you can never be successful like that. If your employer hired you to do a job, and you, have, you are in IT, you are expected to do some programming for some you know, different softwares and so on and so forth, you cannot 
enjoy yourself at the job and help others by serving them coffee. Huh? So you tell all the other employees, don't worry, coffee's on me. I bring the gahwa and the shai. You just relax. So you say, well, I'm enjoying my job, life is good, and I'm helping others. Have a good time. You can never be successful at a company if you don't do your job. And if you have a job in this life, which we do, then you can never be successful unless you do your job. You cannot enjoy life and simply help others by disregarding what Allah expects of you. So that is a very false understanding of things. Allah says, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ Then did you think that we created you uselessly and that to us you would not be returned? Did you think that everything is just vanity, you come and have a good old time and that you will not be returned to Allah? No. So exalted is Allah above that. The sovereign, the truth, there is no deity except Him, Lord of the noble throne. So this could never be the case. This, brothers and sisters in Islam, could never be the case. There's a purpose of life, and if you cannot function at a company without doing your job, then you will not be able to function in this life without doing the job that God had expected of you, which is to adhere to the teachings of Islam and live accordingly. وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرْ لَا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ وَقُلْ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ وَرْحَمْ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And the continuation of the ayat, And whoever invokes besides Allah another deity, for which he has no proof, and they have absolutely no proof, then his account is only with his Lord. Indeed, the disbelievers will not succeed, and say, my Lord, forgive and have mercy and you are the best of the merciful. And we say, oh Allah, forgive and have mercy. You are the best of the merciful. Indeed, this is what it is. There is an objective of life. It is not entertainment. It is not to come and enjoy yourself, become successful and die. There is accountability in the life to come and you need to meet the requirements of that. People return to God during suffering. Another possible explanation to why we suffer, that when you suffer, very often people are heedless, huh? You're having so much of a good time, you forget about salah, you forget about siyam, you forget about obedience, until calamity strikes. And all of a sudden, you wake up and you find yourself running to the masjid, huh? Running to the masjid after the salah, making dua, oh Allah forgive me, I made a mistake, I've erred and so on and so forth. So this is a fact. Now, uh, Professor Bart didn't like it too much. He said, God should simply stop the suffering if he's loving. If there's a loving God, why do you have to suffer to begin with? And this is why I told you earlier, when we said, is God all loving? Said, hold on, we need to have a small time out. Allah is not all loving in the ultimate sense. Allah loves those who deserve love, and He does not love those who do not deserve love. So it is a matter of acquiring love. Just like, again, we'll strike worldly examples, you own a company, you cannot love all of your, uh, all of your employees, you know, without any without the distinction because they're not the same. The one who does the job, the one who supports the business, the one that helps the business boom, is not like the one who comes late and is a bad example of the company. I mean, this is natural. So how can God be all loving to everyone, even though people are not the same? So we say, Allah is not all loving in a sense. And Allah says concerning that, this is the part that we all love. Huh? Declare unto my slaves that truly I am the all forgiven, the most merciful. But there's a continuation. And that my torment is indeed the most painful torment. So they are both. They are both. Allah allows those who deserve suffering to suffer. And Allah will save those who deserve salvation from the ultimate suffering, which is the hellfire. Because of their conduct, their behavior in this life. Allah says, and verily we will make them taste of the near torment, 
which is the torment of the life of this world, disasters, calamities, prior to the supreme torment in the hereafter. Why? In order that they may repent and return to Allah. So this very evil, what appears to be evil, which is torment, becomes good. Because there's nothing better than you returning to Allah. There's nothing better than you returning to Allah and repenting to Him. So in this case, we prove our earlier case, which is that evil is not ultimately evil, because even what appears to be evil contains goodness within. And this is a classical example. If the only good that you get from evil is that you return to Allah, then this is the best goodness in the world. And that evil becomes nothing. How often have people returned to Allah when their parents died? Or when their loved one died? They were heedless from Allah. When somebody died, they became obedient. That death which has been decreed for everyone, which appears to be evil, the loss of loved ones, became the ultimate goodness for this individual. So you see that it is relevant. Good and evil is relevant. And very often goodness is there, but most people fail to see it due to their inability to do so. And finally, قُلْ أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say, obey Allah and His Messenger. But if they turn away, then indeed Allah does not like the disbelievers. And this is the point that we were trying to prove. Allah is all loving to those who acquire the love of Allah. And when they acquire the love of Allah, Allah will bless them. He will increase them. He will bestow His bounties upon them. He will give them more than they deserve. If they have what? Acquired the love of Allah through what? Obeying Allah and His Messenger. But if you don't do that, then you don't deserve any love. This is the most logical thing in the world. Not, you cannot love people unconditionally. You cannot. Because people are different and some people deserve love and some people deserve the opposite. Professor Bart Ehrman says, I'm not worried about the hereafter. He said he, this is the thing that used to scare him the most when he, in the verge, in that, in, that, in that phase where he was leaving Christianity into agnosticism, that, that area, that phase of his life, that he said the only thing that worried him is the life to come. What if he's wrong? Huh? What if he goes to the hellfire? Then eventually he almost like grew out of it. We don't know where he stands right now. But he said he's not worried about the hereafter anymore. And we say to him, إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ فَالَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ مُنْكِرَةٌ وَهُمْ مُسْتَكْبِرُونَ Your God is one God, not three in one. But those who do not believe in the hereafter, their hearts are disapproving and they are arrogant. You have to worry about the hereafter because the hereafter is coming around the corner. It shall come to pass. It shall take place. It shall occur. The same way you are seeing what you're seeing in front of you. If, you, if you're 100% if you're sure that this is a fact, then the day of judgment is more factual than your own vision and your own intellect. That day will come and we should be worried about the hereafter. Because on that day, it will not benefit regret. Regret will be of no benefit and it will not save anyone. وَيَوْمَ uh, on the day where the oppressor will bite on his hand and he will say, I wish I had taken a path with the messenger. I wish I had followed the path of guidance which leads to Jannah. Another ayah. For those who do not believe in the hereafter is the de description of evil. And for Allah is the highest attribute and he is exalted in might. The wise. Professor Bart says all religions have problems. We say, you're right, except Islam. All religions ultimately have problems because they are man made. And whenever human beings make something, it's gonna have problems. Anything you buy, cell phone, recorder, watch, house, car, has problems. Even if it's good in the beginning, it will have problems. Why? Man-made. And if they are busting up cars and cell phones, don't ask about religion. That has been even worse. And so they have pretty much destroyed it. But the only exception to that is Islam. 
Islam does not have any problems. And I challenge any human being upon earth to present one that we cannot answer. They may say many things, you have four wives, women are oppressed, uh, you have, whatever they say, there's an answer. Logical and according to previous teachings and scriptures and confirmed in the Quran. The only people who don't accept it are those who lack logic. Anything that they present, there's an answer for it. Any misconception, there's an answer for it. The only religion without any problems is Islam. Bart Ehrman said, I continue to seek the truth. We sincerely hope so. And Mr. Bart, if you are seeking the truth, then Islam is the solution and the truth. Islam is the solution for the problem of suffering. Because Allah told you why we suffer and what you need to do during suffering and what you will get if you endure with patience. If you're looking for the truth, the truth has been presented. He's a scholar. He has knowledge of religion. He has a doctor in divinity. He should know if he was to look into the teachings of Islam that they are from God. We assume so. If he is genuine in the statement, I continue to seek the truth. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of them to the truth. Just quickly, before we conclude, other wisdoms behind why we suffer that we learn from the teachings of Islam, besides answering his. To attain true submission and servitude to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ إِنْقَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينُ And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge, barely doing it. If he is touched by good, he is reassured by it. But if he is struck by trial, he turns on his face. He goes away from the teachings and the religion. He has lost this world and the hereafter, that is the evident loss. So through the suffering, a distinction is made between those who worship Allah truly all the time and those who are on the edge. As soon as the calamity happens, khalas, I want to leave. Huh? I remember when I was a young boy, my cousin, who had just started to pray in the masjid, you know, they, they were living a different lifestyle, then Allah guided them at some point in their lives. And uh, what happened was, you know, our, our parents were very sensitive with, with touching things in the house in order not to break them. It's just like a sickness, particularly uh, glass. So what he did, he brought a thermometer, you know, the one that they used to measure the temperature. And while he was playing with it, it fell and broke. Okay. Now he knows that his mom, yani she, will, she will whoop him. Okay. She will, she will teach him a, a, a lesson for breaking the thermometer so he was very much concerned so what he did is funny he uh, the you know the mercury that is in in there this was all scattered all around still he managed to bring it together somehow and he taped it huh he taped it and put it there he said i'm gonna go to the masjid right now huh? to pray the jama'ah and i'm gonna ask allah to bring this thing back together <laughs> and so he did he went he prayed he came back and it was still broken. And he stopped doing salah. He's a young man. Alhamdulillah, he learned afterwards that this is nonsense. He was a young teenager, perhaps before the age of puberty. He was not held accountable yet. But the point is, he, he put everything associated with worship to Allah granting him this request, which is the thermometer being you know, fixed before his mother just beats him up. So some people have this attitude, even though they may not be as uh, you know, silly with this example I gave, but they have this understanding. That unless Allah gives them, then they are, they are right. Once calamity strikes, hey, say, why is God doing this to me? They lose their faith in the life of this life and life to come. So then suffering is beautiful because a distinction is made between the true believers and the wishy-washy ones. You know, those who are inconsistent. One day they are good, the next day they're off. Secondly, if you're hungry, close your eyes. I know you are. Calamities remind you of the great blessings of, and of good health and ease. When you are suffer, you remember the chocolate milkshake, milkshake that you had the other day. And so, actually, when you suffer, you get to appreciate. And they say you don't appreciate something until you lose it. You know, you don't appreciate things until they're gone. Then you say, subhanAllah, I had a blessing. And so when the human beings are tested in this fashion, you get to appreciate the good. So 
this is a very beneficial point that you'll be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll be thankful accordingly to Him. Another uh, wisdom behind that, calamity show you the true nature of this world. Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Verily we have created man in toil, which means in hardship, in suffering. Allah told us that we were created in the state of suffering. And so then, this is life. Don't trip over it. Don't become overwhelmed with the suffering because the objective of life is that you suffer in order to succeed. And you cannot enter any school and attain any diploma in any way, shape or form unless you suffer. Have you ever been to school and just, you just had a good time? You sat in the classroom the whole time like this, you don't have a notebook, you don't have a pen, you don't pay for the tuition, you do absolutely nothing. And then they give you a, a diploma, say congratulations, you've, you know, you graduated with honors. No way. For you to earn that, you better be a serious student. So this is in practical life, everyday life. You do not succeed unless you suffer. So suffering will help you attain goals. Suffering in this life for the sake of Allah will help you attain the life to come, which leads us to the next point also. وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُونَ وَلَعِبُ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانَ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ And this worldly life is not but diversion and amusement. Just a bunch of fun. And indeed the home of the hereafter, that is the eternal life if only they knew. But many people know not. This is the nature of life. The real life is in the life to come. Home is over there. Home is when you put both feet in Jannah. When both feet are in paradise, then you are home. Suffering shall end and you will eternally enjoy the blessings of God. Until then, you have to earn it. You have to earn it. You don't want to earn it, you will not get it. You strive, you get, you fail, then you will be deprived. Common sense, logical, I think everybody understands, I don't need to get uh, extra philosophical this particular evening. With that we say, Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. How perfect you are, O oh Allah, and I praise you. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except you. I seek your forgiveness and turn to you in repentance. If you if have you questions, if you want to criticize, or which is most welcome, or anything along these lines, you could visit the website, onewaytoparadise.net. You could email at onewaytoparadise at gmail.com or you could check out some of these videos and the previous ones on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash onewaytoparadise. So Zakal Makhano for your patience. I know this was a little longer than usual, uh, but uh, the information, you know, was very necessary and I really wanted to present all of it accordingly. So with that said, we could uh, turn on the lights and we could entertain the questions, inshallah, because I think some brothers are sleepy already. Assalamu alaikum brother wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah What do you think of the argument that there is no such thing as evil It's just lack of good For example there is no ugliness only lack of drought or beauty Well uh, we, we cannot, I cannot say what I think Because what I think is irrelevant It's whatever we learn from the Quran and the Sunnah and we learn from the Quran and the Sunnah that evil exists. And it is not simply the lack of goodness, it is the existence of evil. Now we said that we understand that from that evil goodness may come about, yes. But I cannot say that evil does not exist because we have in the Quran and the Sunnah the word shar, right or wrong, and that is evil. And so that is the answer for that insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Since God has no problem, why does He communicate? Why doesn't He com uh, communicate directly with men? He chose to communicate via prophets. If He communicated directly with all men, then the, there will be no problem in believing too. Well, <sighs> come on now. If you want me to be fair, serious about this, uh, then if I told you that uh, I have a comb behind the table, okay? And I want to test your faith in me, okay? I'm your friend, you've known me for 15 years, and you know that I don't lie, okay? But I want to test you tonight. So I tell you, I'm telling you that I have a comb under the table. Now, if you say that I do, what does that mean? 
You have faith in your friend. If you deny, then you have denied that particular faith you have in me. The point being, what is the point? There's a test. There's a test. But if I told you, do you believe that I have a comb? There's no point anymore. There's no point anymore in you trusting me as a friend or not because I'm showing you the comb. You have destroyed the test from in and within itself. So the whole purpose of belief is belief in the unseen. Allah even told us that He did not send angels. Because if angels were to come to the people first, the people would not be able to receive because of the variation between a human being and the angels. But then if they were to come, then what's the point anymore? Because the disbelievers suggested that. We want to see you bring a fountain from the earth. We want to see you have a castle. Why do you walk in a marketplace? To the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you see something, then you no longer have faith, you have knowledge. Faith entails that you believe in that which is unseen after you have acquired knowledge that God has given you concerning that which is seen, such as the revelation and the intellect which He gave you. So that defeats the purpose of life. If God was to communicate, there would be no disbeliever. And if there's no disbeliever, there's no point in having heaven or hell, and there's no point for having existence, and the whole thing will be demolished. And so this is a nonsensical explanation or a question actually. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum assalam, rahmatullah. Could you please explain Shab Ibarat? I don't know if I said it correctly. Is there any evidence from Quran and Sunnah to now people celebrate and worship whole night? There's absolutely no authentic evidence about celebrating the 15th of Sha'ban. Okay, I know it's very common. The only thing that is there is a narration that the scholars have differed concerning its authenticity about the fact that Allah forgives all of the creation on the 15th of Sha'ban except the disbelievers and those who are two Muslims who are contending. They, have, they are in disagreement. This hadith was labeled as weak by many of the ulama. But let us assume that it is not weak, it is authentic. It does not suggest in any way, shape or form that you do Qiyam or Siyam or Dhikr or recitation of the Quran. You follow me? If I told you, I'm a boss, you work for me. Tomorrow is a day off. Okay? Tomorrow is a day off. You're free to do whatever you want. Can you go tell the employees, the boss said we should go to the Corniche tomorrow? Can you do that? No. I didn't say go to the Corniche, I said you have a day off. You going to the Corniche is adding something that is not necessarily suggested by giving you a day off. You may sleep. So the fact that if this is to happen, if this is information that is authentic, which means that Allah forgives the creation, where does it, how does that indicate that you should go do any particular act of worship? You cannot. And all of the narrations used are weak or fabricated. This is why the Prophet ﷺ or the companions never did anything special on the 15th of Sha'ban and the Muslims should follow their footsteps in goodness and do absolutely nothing on the 15th of Sha'ban. It's a regular day. It's a regular day like the rest of the days. If you happen to be fasting, because you fast Monday and Thursday, and it falls on a Thursday or a Monday, and you're fasting with the intention of, of Monday on Thursday, no problem. But if you add the intention of the 15th of Sha'ban, then you are in the realm of bid'ah. And once you enter into innovation, you will definitely go astray. And we don't want anyone to go astray. We want to go to Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, if Allah has wished redemption on someone, then he tests with calamity. So whoever doesn't have calamity, not having redemption, so they, they go to hell or what? No, no, it's not like that. It's not arbitrary like that. We have to really have a, a you know, as we mentioned, the issue with the people that they're having is that they're trying to give one single answer for why we suffer. And in Islam, we said we have more than one answer. See, when Professor Bard was being presented with the points, he said, yeah, I don't agree with this because it doesn't explain that. So I reject that. We say, no, in this case, this is an explanation. In the other case, that is an explanation. So we as Muslims have more than one answer of why we suffer. One of which is the one that is mentioned in the question here, is the fact that Allah may afflict you with a calamity as means of redemption. It does not mean that if you are not afflicted with a calamity that you're going to go to hell. It may be that Allah is facilitating your affairs in this life. Or Allah does not want to raise you in degrees because it could be redemption or expiation of sins or it could be to raise you in degrees like the Prophet Do you think all of the suffering he went through is because of his sinful ways? A'udhu Billah. 
No way. He was the most righteous of righteous. It's because Allah wanted to raise him in status and degree. So then calamities may be in order for Allah to enhance your situation, not necessarily as you know, uh, sins. And if you're not being tested with a calamity, it does not mean that you're going to go to hellfire. No, this is not the case. Uh, the month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was revealed, the guidance to men and clear proofs of guidance and distinction. Question brother, does the ayah mentioned above means that the Quran was completely revealed in the month of Ramadan? Can you please elaborate? Yes, actually according to the ulama, the Quran was revealed in, in, in its entirety from, the, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angel Jibreel to the as-sama, to the heavens. Then as a whole revelation, the whole book, from the preserved tablet to the Ad-Dunya, as sama Ad-Dunya. Then from there on, it was revealed in portions according to the circumstances of the Prophet wasallam and his companions over the period of 23 years. So the Quran was revealed as a whole book among the angels in the heavens on that night, which is Laylatul Qadr, as we know. And then the actual verses were revealed accordingly over the duration of 23 years according to the situations and the circumstances of the Muslims, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad So this is the explanation that is given by the ulama. So I hope that uh, adequately answers that question. Okay. Any questions from the floor? Yes, brother. Um, not, not nowadays, but in olden times, if a person didn't know about Islam and passed away not knowing is he going to go to hell? Actually, whether it is, the brother asked if somebody had died in the older days, in the previous days, if somebody had died before without knowing about Islam, does he go to hell? The, qu the answer is whether it is in this day and time after the, the message of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or in the previous times, it, it doesn't matter which messenger was a, a, a around during that time. Whoever did not receive the message will not be punished by Allah until he is tested. Allah Azza wa says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسولا. We were never to punish people until a messenger has been sent. Meaning until revelation has been conveyed. Okay, I'll, I'll Zakallah khair. Barakallah khair. So Allah will never punish anyone until, until uh, the message has been delivered. So we have a hadith, the hadith of Al-Aswad radiallahu anhu, which is authentic, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that on the day of judgment, there will be people who will come and say that they never received the message. And Allah will test them on the day of judgment. Whoever obeys Allah will enter Jannah, whoever disobeys will enter Jahannam, and that will be a summary of their life. So no one will be placed in the hellfire without earning it. Is that clear? Allah will not oppress anyone. Allah will not oppress anyone. No one will be punished unless they have been given a chance to accept guidance or reject. Those who die before guidance comes to them, Allah will test them accordingly on the day of judgment per the, per the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sorry. If a person does sin, for sure he will be punished in the life hereafter. Is there any special mention in the Quran that the person will be punished in this world also? Actually, I need to correct the question. If a person does sin, for sure he will be punished in the life hereafter? No. No, not for sure. Rather, it falls under the Mashiach of Allah, under the will of Allah. If Allah wills, he may punish. If Allah wills, he may forgive. Now we know anyone who dies with Tawheed, he falls under the Mashiach of Allah. If Allah wills, he will forgive him, even if he was sinful. So this is not, no one can make any conclusive statement concerning that. This is Allah's judgment on the day of judgment. So not everyone who is sinful today will be punished in the life to come. If Allah wills, He may punish him and He may leave him. He may let him go. But because none of us can guarantee that He will be let go, you don't gamble and take a chance. You don't gamble and say, well, maybe Allah will make me among those whom He will not punish. Maybe you will be punished. So because of this possibility, you don't even go there. Um, concerning that whether the Quran has a mention of the person who will be punished in this world also, yeah, all of the ayat that were quoted. No calamity befalls you except that which you have earned with your own hands. And so Allah told us that, you know, 
the jaza sayya sayya to mithlu the 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 equal the recompense of a sin is also a punishment from Allah equally so we have general quranic verses and prophetic traditions which indicate that this is the case this is the case that uh, you the some of the punishment you receive in this world is due to your sins okay but concerning the hereafter it falls under the mashiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Firstly, I have programmed my عمرة. I have a doubt. I stay in. Okay, this this I I can hardly hear the handwriting. Read the handwriting. So perhaps I can speak to the questioner concerning عمرة after the lecture, inshallah. And if I do have an answer, then I will provide you with it accordingly, inshallah. So keep it on the side. Uh, did I leave anything out? Yeah, this, this one. This one. Man, this is confusing. Zakumullah khairan for your assistance. How do we answer uh, Muslims who say that? How do we know that Sheikh Albani and Sheikh Bin Baz were righteous Muslims? And the hadith is labeled Sahih are really Sahih? Well, uh, how do we know? We know this when they die. Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah used to say to the people of innovation, the difference between us and you shall be clear during the funeral, the funeral procession. You look when one of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah dies, you look at the reaction of the Muslim Ummah. And when the, one of the people of innovation dies, no one even knows. And when they do know, they make dua against them. And some may say, Alhamdulillah, who saved us from his evil and his wicked ways. So this is clear and distinct, A. B, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make the existence in this life something mysterious where the truth is, un, is hidden and cannot be identified or recognized. On the contrary, truth is so strong and clear and so are the people who carry it, then as soon as you see it and hear it, if you are sound in your heart, you will understand. And you will find that inclination towards it. So you read and you listen to the statements of these two scholars, including Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen rahmatullah alayhi, and others. And it will become clear to you that these were the scholars that were following the footsteps of their early scholars, who were told by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that they are the ones who will carry this deen and they will remain upon the truth. It doesn't matter who opposes them or who leaves them alone. Who abandons them? It doesn't matter. They will remain upon the truth until the day of judgment. And we know the series of scholars from the time of the Sahaba until today. Going through the, the ulama of the four madhahib, going through the tabi'een, going through uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, rahimallah, al-Zahabi, until today. The scholars of Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaa are known, recognized, loved and respected by those who love the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the evidence. You find anyone who loves the sunnah, you will find that he loves them. And the people of innovation are usually the ones who don't like them. Because they already have disagreements about being keen on adhering to the sunnah. And that is something that they really do not entertain. Is the hadith labeled as sahih, really sahih? Of course it's really sahih. Of course it's really authentic because we have Hassan and we have Da'if and we have a number of other labels that the narration may receive depending on the chain of narrators. Now this science of hadith is a miracle in and within itself. It is, it is unparalleled in this whole world how individuals' lifestyles can be recorded. So much so that when we want to label a hadith, the ulama would actually mention all of the men who had narrated this hadith and tell you whether they were trustworthy individuals or not, whether they were practicing Muslims or not, whether their memory was good enough or not. This is amazing. You can't do this. If, if, if I was to say something to your brother and it had to go around to the brother all the way in the back, it would be something totally different. Because some of us may have language deficiencies, some of us, our memory may not be as good, some of us may be, like to play games, huh? Some of us, A'udhu Billah, no one is here, they may be hypocrite, huh? Sitting amongst us. And you know, we say, La ilaha illallah, and he says, Jesus is God. <laughs> huh? Hey! So the only way you could, you could, you know, uh, actualize the fact that this hadith is sahih is by, be, by knowing everybody here. I know each and every one 
So if I trust this brother and this brother and so on and so forth until the last, then we could say without a doubt that this information I gave has, been, has reached the brother at the end authentically. Because everyone involved is known to be a good Muslim practicing and a good memory. This is what hadith means, man. For you to know whether hadith is sahih or not, a lot of steps are taken. And this is a miracle in and within itself. So when they say the hadith is sahih, meaning every person in the chain was sound, was of a religious commitment, had a memory that was intact, and as such, the wording of the hadith does not contradict anything that we know in Islam, then the cases this hadith is labeled as sahih, meaning it is 100% said by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because this is included in the preservation of the deen of Islam. Allah preserved the Quran and the sunnah which explains the Quran. Because if you were to say that Allah did not preserve the sunnah, then you're saying that you praying dhuhr, the way you pray today, is not really guaranteed. Because Allah did not mention in the Quran how you pray dhuhr. So if you accept the way you pray dhuhr, meaning you're accepting the sunnah, and Allah made it in such a way where both are preserved for you to be able to carry out the acts of worship. Some things he put in the Quran are the things he revealed through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is all part of the comprehensiveness of the deen of Islam and the fact that the Quran and the Sunnah are preserved and if they label the hadith as sahih then insha'Allah ta'ala it is sahih accordingly and if they say otherwise then it is otherwise as well. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik shalallahu ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.